We live in a sophisticated, growing, ever-changing world with a never-ending need and hunger for power and energy. We rely on fossil fuels, but that's going to have to change because one day there won't be any fossil fuels left. And that's why I'm investigating the truth about alternative energies. Author, musician, meteorite hunter, adventurer. I've led an eventful life. Now I'm exploring exciting STEM careers and recording what I find in the STEM journals. Well, ladies and gentlemen, having grown up down in South London, beer is a subject about which I know a few things. But why are we following an alternative energy story in a brewery? Well, Jeff, I'm an instructor at NAU in the Earth Sciences and Environmental Sustainability Department. There I teach an engineering design class where I challenge my students with a grand design project and it has something to do with the fermentation process in a hmm. brewery. Well, fermentation, definitely a favorite subject of mine, but what does that have to do with engineering design? Basically what we do is we start with grain and we soak that grain in order to extract sugar from it. That sugar gets mixed with water and becomes the base for what we create into beer. So we take that sugar water and we move it into one of our fermentation tanks and then we add yeast to it. That yeast will absorb any oxygen that's already in there through an aerobic process where it reproduces and creates more cells and grows and grows and grows until there's no oxygen left in there. After that, the yeast will switch into an anaerobic process where it starts fermenting. And that fermentation produces three things, ethanol, CO2, and heat. We take the ethanol, and that's what we want to keep in the beer. That's what makes it alcoholic. The heat we take away via these glycol jackets that are on the outsides of the tanks. And then the CO2, currently, we just release to the atmosphere through one of these tanks here where it bubbles up through some water and then dissipates, and we push it out with fans out of the brewery. And it's that CO2 there that I'm asking my students to collect and store and find a use for other than being released into the atmosphere. In fact, I have one of my students here today, Cisco. What have you come up with? We're gonna design a system that captures the CO2 without messing up the beer. Then we're gonna figure out a way to compress that CO2 so we can store it and transport it. So what do you do with the CO2 after you've collected it? We have a colleague, Steve Atkins at NAU, who has a methanol reactor that feeds off CO2. Methanol is a renewable fuel. It can also be used as a feedstock for many chemicals. And he has a trailer up on campus. Is this the energy trailer? Go around the back. Go around the back. Oh, that's the front. Is this the back? I was almost flattened by your energy hey. door. Oh, well, that's gravity at work. Can I offer you a rice cake? Oh, thank you. Sure. Hey, I was just at Wanderlust Brewing Company and Jennifer explained to me about fermentation and CO2 and all of this and that you're turning it into fuel. How do you do that? Well, I like a guy that gets right to the chase. Come on in, I'll show you. All right. So there's a lot of ways to make fuels out of CO2, but the simplest way is to take three hydrogens, combine that with a CO2 molecule, and turn that into Methanol, CH3OH. You also get some water. Once you have the methanol, you can burn that in your car. It's very similar to ethanol. Or you can convert methanol into gasoline. So, but it takes 2.5 gallons of CH3OH to make one gallon of gas. That's the economics and the chemistry of it. Oh, well, speaking of which, thanks for the top up. Oh, sure, and of course that won't give you gas. Okay, so this is the theory written in chalk on a piece of wood. How do you actually put it into practice? For that, you need an engineer. Let me guess. <laughs> Are you an engineer? As a matter of fact, I'm a real life engineer. Hard to believe, isn't it? What an it? amazing coincidence. <laughs> yes. Please continue. We start over here with this device here that literally sucks water out of the air, okay? We take the water, convert it into hydrogen with this box, an electrolyzer. So the hydrogen then goes into this tank. The CO2 is this tank. You already found out where that comes from. 
these things, mix it in the proper ratio. From there, it's off to the races. Really? Yeah. Could you power a racing car with this? Oh, of course. In fact, methanol is considered a racing fuel. No way. Yeah, yeah. Well, in order to do a full demonstration, we probably should get a sports car then. That would be fun, wouldn't it? Yes. Look, it says premium fuel only. Are you sure this is safe? Uh, yes, so premium fuels like 91 octane, this is actually 105 octane. So this is really, really premium fuel. For me, this whole story started with beer. And there's something just beautifully poetic about pouring beer into a German car. <laughs> yes, prost. <laughs> oh, cheers. <laughs> I found this whole thing fascinating, and you're doing very unusual, groundbreaking work. How did you get funding for this? Well, I got funding through the Technology Research and Innovation Fund, which is a part of Arizona state sales tax. A very small portion of that tax goes to uh, all the schools, including the universities. I submitted a proposal for funding for this methanol project. Excellent. <laughs> It works! Of course! It runs! <laughs> it's completely amazing. What, what do you hope to achieve with this in the long run? I hope to build a renewable, domestically produced, and carbon neutral fuel. I'll drink to that, but not in the car. All right. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Next destination on the STEM journals, harvesting algae to produce biodiesel. STEM Journals is sponsored by Copper Point, proud to sponsor STEM education because students who excel in science, technology, engineering, and math will solve the challenges of tomorrow. STEM Journal Supplemental. Henry Gherkin with Arizona State University's Laboratory for Algae Research and Biotechnology studies algae to produce biodiesel that may one day be a fuel source of choice in our future. I'm extremely interested in alternative energy sources, and your specialty, biofuels. What can biofuels do for us? Well, I think over the next 30 to 40 years, we're gonna have issues with running out of fossil fuels, and I think that we're gonna need a good replacement fuel. Biofuels have the potential to fill that niche. Algae's a very simple plant, unlike this bamboo, doesn't have leaves or stems. So how can such a simple plant produce fuels for us? Well, I think it's that simplicity that makes it an ideal organism. It doesn't have to spend the energy to make its tray trunk, to make its root system. It can spend all of its energy on making the fuels for us that we need. And is there one type that's better than another? Are there lots of different types of algae? How do you pick the right one? Well, there are a lot of different types of algae, and some of them are better than others for biofuels. And uh, I have some samples up in the lab I'd love to show you. I would love to see them. Lead on. Here's an algae sample that I collected from the environment. What characteristics are we looking for that might indicate this bit of algae would be a better fuel producer than this one? Well, we want to definitely find algae that grow very quickly, but we also want to find algae that have a lot of oil in it. Uh, and here we see uh, a lot of algae, but uh, this cell in particular seems to have a very large oil drop in it. So we're going to go ahead and go after that guy, try to culture him out and grow him. So, Jeff, here we have the uh, sample of algae that we grew up for you. Come on, Jeff, what are you doing? I got a baseball game to get to. Oh, sorry. Yes, baseball and biofuels. I love that. What's going on here? So this is the algal sample that we isolated from that environmental sample that I showed you. What we're doing now is we're growing it up to see how fast it grows, and we're going to look at the amount of algae per milliliter and how much oil that algae is producing. How do we measure the output? We're gonna go take a sample, so let's go. <laughs> oh, just like that, take yep, the whole guy. <laughs> He's the algae master. Okay, so now we have the algae oil, we're gonna go ahead and dry this down. To do that, we're gonna use a rotovap. So the rotovap uses high temperature and vacuum to evaporate the solvent. So what you see in here happening right now is the solvent is evaporating off the uh, oil. So when it's all done, we'll get a sample that looks like this, which is our oil, which we'll go ahead and turn into biofuel and other fine products. What other products? 
Well, this is the residue that's left over after we extracted the oil. This can be fermented into ethanol, butanol, all kinds of different biofuels. Huh. Uh, we really? also have EPA, DHEA, omega-3 fatty acids that can be produced Wow, this is a supplement. We I have uh, antioxidants uh, such as astaxanthin. Yeah, I could, can we I have nutrient, uh, oh, nutrient oh, supplements oh, oh, such as algaberry hold on a and uh, spirulina, hold on a which is another potential food source. Oh, this is vegan. Organisms. I like that. This. Oh, I heard, yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Spirit. Really? You guys like this stuff? Sure. That's really amazing. What about my algae? Well, your algae didn't exactly make the cut for biofuels production. You're kidding me. After all that? Don't worry. We have a number of other strains that, that are really good producers of algal biofuels. But that was and my favorite. And let me introduce you to Terry Belisle, and she's uh, going to show you around outside where we actually begin to scale up these things for mass production. OK. Can I keep these? Jeff? You must be Terry. Yes, I am. You have an amazing collection of algae here. Tell me about your farm. Here we have the capacity to grow hundreds of thousands of liters of algae. The algae that we find to be a good strain, we come and we bring it out here and we add a whole bunch of water and nutrients to the algae. It grows up to whatever concentration that photobioreactor can handle and then we harvest it for the oil. When are we gonna actually see this on the marketplace when people like me can go and fill up their tank. Well, there's still a lot of research that's being done about the type of strains that are good and also about the type of photobioreactors that are good. This pond is only one kind of photobioreactor that we have here. There's also some economic limitation. We can't grow fast enough to supply the amount of oil that we would need to fuel a car or a plane or many cars or many planes. What would you say are the opportunities for students who would like to work in similar fields? There are all sorts of things that you can do to get involved in this field. They need biologists like me for stuff that's living, like algae. They need engineers to make photobioreactors and other things to grow the algae in. They need chemists to figure out the oil content. Everybody who's interested in science um, can find their niche in this field. You know, we're running out of fossil fuels and it's so important that we take action now. Methanol and biodiesel are both alternative fuels, but they're not the only option for renewable energy. Arizona is a leader in solar energy production, receiving over 300 days of sunshine every year. Woo! And across the line! Christiana Honsberg is a pioneering researcher with the Quest program, studying innovative ways to advance the next generation of solar engineers. Wow, that was great! I completely had a Star Wars moment. Okay, so not only did I feel like I was in Star Wars, it sounded like it too. This car is so fast. How does it get this much acceleration? A electric motor can produce incredible amounts of torque. So when you step on the accelerator, it just takes off. This is one of the fastest cars from zero to 60. <laughs> yeah, I noticed. That was brilliant. Okay, great in town, lots of sun in Phoenix, very nice. But most of my work is out in the boonies. How could I get a vehicle like this? to work out in the screening desert. Absolutely. In fact, what they're putting on now is uh, solar panels. So when they put the solar panels on, the whole car will be solar powered. It'll power the car wherever you want. How exactly do you transfer light via the panels into power? Well, we actually make some of these up in our lab and um, can go up and show you how we do it. I'm not leaving the car, sorry. <laughs> I'm holding a beautiful single terminated Quartz crystal. What does this have to do with the process? The most important part of converting sunlight to electricity is that we use a special type of material called a semiconductor. And this is what we start with. Quartz or SiO2. We take the oxygen out of the SiO2 and then refine it into these single crystalline wafers right here. So this is a crystalline wafer. That's right. And it's wafer thin. Like making pizza. What's happening in this furnace is that we diffuse some other types of materials into our silicon wafer, and they make what we call a PN junction. 
And a PN junction is the basis of nearly all semiconductor devices, an LED, a laser, a solar cell, a detector. When we pull it out, we'll see that it will actually look a little bit different as well. One major step left to do. The last thing we have to do on it is put on metal. And Sebastian will help you do that. I am your eager student. Please walk me through this. Right, so right here we have a vacuum wafer chuck. Uh, you're gonna go ahead and put it on there. I'm gonna disengage the vacuum. Okay. And then you'll be able to position it properly. There you go. So we're gonna go ahead and send this wafer inside now to have okay. the screen printing done. Uh, you can go ahead and press these two buttons right there. Okay, simultaneously. This is my big moment. Three, two, one. Yes. But now what's gonna happen is we actually have to print the paste on it. So this is the screen printer right here that has the design that we'll put onto the wafer. Now that squeegee that you saw before it closed, it's actually gonna come forward and press the paste through the mesh and onto the wafer, leaving the pattern behind. It's the same sort of principle as t-shirt screen printing. Yeah, exactly. We ought to hire ah, you. Ah, it's going. So let's see what we got. Look at that. Would you do the honors? I would be delighted. Thank I'll you. push off the vacuum and okay. So now we've basically got a finished solar cell. We've got a PN junction. We've got metal contacts on the front. We would redo the exact same thing for metal contacts on the back. A painted cell. It's lucky I went to art school. <laughs> We're going to now measure the properties of this solar cell. We'll measure this guy at liquid nitrogen temperatures. So that's um, <laughs> substantially lower than room temperature. So in order to make a good solar cell, we needed to have lots of absorption in it. We can see how it responds to the light, how the carriers are behaving in the cell, how many of those light-generated electrons are being turned into electricity. What are you doing here at ASU that's different from everybody else? We're increasing the level of these types of solar cells to efficiencies that were previously not thought possible. And some of those have already been done and are out there, and we'll go take a look at some of them now. How is this different from the technology that we just saw upstairs? It's more efficient. So the standard silicon solar cells that we made in the lab upstairs, they have about the same efficiency as people do converting food into heat or movement. But these right here are much more efficient than that. If you look down carefully, you can see that rather than being a big solar cell, they've actually got optical elements concentrating down onto a special material. And those materials and the optics allow us to get about four times the efficiency of a conventional silicon solar cell. I love that. Coming up next, Cynthia, a young STEM investigator, and I will take a peek at a school district's energy living laboratory. STEM Journal's personal log. Methanol, biodiesel, and solar power have solid potential in this advancing industry, and major companies like Chevron are joining the movement. Hey, is this your idea of a breakfast? Mm, rice cakes, very wholesome, no salt, no sugar, you should try one. Anyway, uh, there's Allison. Oh, good morning. Good morning, how are you? Good, thank you. Pardon my breakfast. <laughs> so right. when I started filling up, I noticed solar panels on the roof of the gas station. Is that typical of Chevron stations? Actually, most people think of Chevron as a gas station, but we are actually a global energy company. In fact, my company, Chevron Energy Solutions, is a division of Chevron that works specifically with renewable energy and energy efficiencies on school buildings and government buildings. We here as part of the energy industry are trying to work together with schools to develop programs and activities for students to learn about these things and learn about the research that's going on. And in fact, one of our clients is Tempe Union High School District. They have created all of their campuses into living laboratories. My high school has solar panels, so does that mean that's part of your program? Absolutely, yes. We installed a solar thermal hot water heating system on McClintock High. Can we see that? Absolutely. Let's go take a look. All right. The solar thermal hot water heating system uses the passive heat from the sun's rays 
to heat hot water that can be used in the building. So what's great about that is that then you don't use any electricity to heat the hot water, which can help the environment, reducing greenhouse gases, and save the district money. Well, I've been coming to this school for the past four years now, and I had no idea that McClintock had that kind of system. I'm keen to see it. What does it look like? Actually, it's right there. Oh, ha, hidden in plain sight. It looks like two completely different designs. Absolutely. This is a demonstration site that shows two different solar thermal hot water heating systems that are used around the globe. On the left side, you see the flat plate collection system, and on the right side is the evacuated tubes collector. And all of that hot water then can be used inside the building. Students can actually see the data on an online dashboard and compare the two different technologies. Okay, where does the hot water go? You probably don't know this about me, but I'm actually an expert at washing dishes. Just recently, I was washing pottery sherds at the Arizona Museum of Natural History. They're nearly a thousand years old. Well, if you say you're such an expert, you should probably finish my dishes. Oh, really? I don't know, you're doing quite a good job. I think you could actually have a career as a dishwasher if you're interested once you're done with school. Unless there's any other career path that interests you. Actually, I was thinking of going into the film and TV industry. Film and television? That's a terrible idea. It's bloody awful. Great. My nails are done for. You know what? I take it back. You'd be perfect for television. STEM Journal concluding entry. As fossil fuels supplies dwindle and our climate changes, the need for innovative engineers and entrepreneurs to advance the energy landscape is necessary to save our planet. The technological and political challenges are numerous, but we must never underestimate the creative minds that drive the human race. I told Jeff that I wanted to get into the film industry, but after experiencing everything with the Living Lab program here at McClintock High School, I want to learn more about careers in alternative energy sources. Alternative energy is a rapidly growing, changing field. We need chemists, biologists, entrepreneurs, and engineers, because today's solutions are not gonna solve tomorrow's problems. And it all starts in the classroom. Ask good questions to your teachers. Make top grades in mathematics and all areas of science. Get involved in science clubs and competitions so that you can bring your new ideas to the world. On the next entry of the STEM journals, it's CSI Arizona, as I investigate the real world of forensics and the technology that will transform it in the future. That's next week on the STEM journals.